Busch Gardens Williamsburg is the best park in the SeaWorld chain. This massive Virginia park is a marvel between the deep coaster lineup, beautiful landscaping, European theming, and so much more. Find out why this is one of the world's best theme parks in this review. Anheuser-Busch is one of the largest breweries in America. Back in 1903, they experimented with their first entertainment complex with Busch Gardens Pasadena. This was a botanical garden that closed in 1937. They built their second Busch Gardens Park in Tampa in 1959. It also started as a botanical garden, but they rapidly grew their offerings to include a zoo and amusement rides. Today, it's one of the biggest and best amusement parks in the country. The success of this park prompted the brewery to build additional parks. Three more Busch Gardens parks were built in the 1960s and 1970s. Busch Gardens Los Angeles operated from 1964 to 1979 until it was closed for a brewery expansion. Busch Gardens Houston operated from just 1971 to 1973 before closing due to unprofitability. The third fared much better. Busch Gardens Williamsburg opened in May of 1975. This one started off as an amusement park from day one, but still had the chain's usual focus on greenery. Interestingly, it was the second major amusement park to open in Virginia that year. King's Dominion is located roughly one hour north, and opened just two weeks prior. The two parks compete for the same markets, but they've been able to successfully coexist, and they've grown to two of the largest parks in the East Coast. Busch Gardens grew over the next three decades, blending thrills, theming, and record-breaking roller coasters. The park opened the world's tallest and fastest roller coaster in 1978 with Loch Ness Monster, one of the first successful suspended coasters in 1984 with Big Bad Wolf, the world's tallest and fastest inverted coaster in 1997 with Alpengeist, the coaster with the most total feet of drops in 1999 with Apollo's Chariot, and the world's tallest and fastest dive coaster in 2007 with Griffin. While these records have all been broken, the rides transcended their records and were revered for their quality. In 2008, Anheuser-Busch was acquired by the Belgian-based InBev. This included all of Busch's properties, including the Busch Entertainment Theme Park Division. InBev quickly sold the theme park division to the Blackstone Group, who reached a deal to retain use of the Busch Gardens name. However, they renamed Busch Entertainment as SeaWorld Parks. Over the next decade, Busch Gardens Williamsburg invested heavily in launch coasters. They've added three over the past decade, with the most recent being Pantheon, and they show no signs of slowing down with two more in planning. One is a family launch coaster that is expected to open in 2023, reusing the curse of Dark Castle show building. The second is a massive shuttle coaster that is expected to be placed in the Drakenfire's old plot, and it will likely become the tallest and fastest coaster in Virginia. While Pantheon was recently criticized for its NQ theming, I think that's because of how nice the rest of the park looks. This park has been named the most beautiful park in the world by Napa and the best landscape park in the world by the Golden Ticket Awards for decades. And I can certainly see why. This park is stunningly gorgeous. This park flawlessly combines landscaping and theming. Busch Gardens is a super woodsy park. The abundance of trees are a godsend on those hot summer days. And many of the coasters utilize these settings to perfection. By day, you get scenic views rocketing through the woods. By night, most rides are in total darkness, augmenting the thrills. I think this is one of the best parks in the world for night rides, and thankfully, they're usually open late most days in peak season and most weekends year-round. All these trees, plus the park's use of waterways, somehow give this giant park a laid-back feel. The greenery is accompanied by multiple themed lands, most themed to European countries. While the entrance itself just looks okay, the first land gives you a taste of what's to come. Themed to England, I love the use of classic architecture, the phone booths, and the miniature replica of Big Ben. The park does go a little over the top with the English flags, but the area is otherwise nice. Italy is divided into two areas, San Marco and Festa Italia. San Marco is the nicer of the two. Themed to the Renaissance period, I love the flowers in Da Vinci's Gardens of Inventions, plus all the buildings, restaurants, and storefronts. Festa Italia is themed to a fair celebrating the return of Marco Polo. It's probably the weakest looking area in the park because it feels more like an upscale carnival, but it still does look fun with all the colors. 
Germany is split into two areas, Oktoberfest and Rheinfeld. Oktoberfest feels like a Bavarian town, and that atmosphere is captured perfectly in the Fest House. Rheinfeld continues the feel of the prior, but you also have a ski-themed plaza around Alpengeist. France also has two sections. You have the quaint and prosperous Aquitaine section, juxtaposed by New France, which has the feel of a working town settlement. Ireland may be one of the weakest areas for rides, but all the facades look great, and the area has a pleasant feel between the stores, pubs, and shows. Scotland is where you'll find the chain's prized Clydesdales, plus the classic Loch Ness Monster roller coaster, themed to the famous legend. All these areas are charming between their style, architecture, and music. It truly feels like you're bouncing from European country to country. The park sort of feels like a looser version of World Showcase at Epcot, complete with some country-specific food and shops. But this park also has some bona fide roller coasters in each area. Then for kids, you have two colorful and fanciful areas. Sesame Street Forest of Fun is the more popular of the two, featuring the beloved characters from the show and a handful of rides. Land of Dragons is towards the back of the park. While this area is older, kids love the giant play structure, and coaster enthusiasts will probably like it for the vantage points it offers for the park's coasters. Busch Gardens Williamsburg is colossal. It spans 422 acres, making it one of the largest parks in the world. While the countries form a loop, the park can be tricky to navigate. The pathways between countries are super narrow and not always clear. I've visited this park enough to know all the pathways, but I know plenty of first-timers who get confused. The park is also very hilly, especially if you utilize the cut-through between Scotland and Rhinefield that heads down to the river. Therefore, I strongly recommend using the Skyride and Train. The Skyride travels counterclockwise between France, England, and Germany. The Busch Gardens Railway Train then travels clockwise between Scotland, Festa Italia, and New France. I find the latter is more efficient because it tends to have a shorter wait and you can remain on board for multiple stops. And both these rides offer some awesome views of the coasters, many of which are difficult to see from the main pathways. Even on busy days, it is possible to ride plenty at this park. The B&Ms are extremely easy to re-ride. Because of their high capacities, they're usually no more than a 10-15 to 15 minute wait most days. And if they do have a long line, all three now offer single rider lines. There are four coasters that can get significantly longer waits, mostly because of their low capacities. Pantheon opened just this year, and it understandably has been getting the longest lines because of the newness and quality. Tempesto only runs a single 18-person train. Then, while both Verbolton and Invader run multiple trains, these two rides also see just 18 riders per train, and they're highly popular with families. Every coaster that can run multiple trains usually will. Operations are usually solid, as the crew is often the next train ready to go once the prior one hits the brake run. I want to call special attention to the crew at Apollo's Chariot, who can and will roll three trains in busy days. On a crowded day, you can purchase the Quick Queue Skip the Line Pass. This ranges from $40 all the way up to $200 depending on the tier and day. Unless the park is packed to the gills, I would not advise buying it. Even on most weekends, I've had no trouble riding countless attractions. But there are two other big reasons why I wouldn't buy it. The first is that three of the coasters with the longest lines are only available once in the highest tier. This includes the brand new Pantheon, plus both Invader and Tempesto. The other reason is that a few of the coasters assign quick queue riders to specific rows. The most notable is Apollo's Chariot. If you use Standby, you can choose any row that you'd like. Before I give my recommended touring plan, I need to note that this park is notorious for using staggered opening times. Everything between Festa, Italia, and New France usually opens with the park, but the rides in the back areas typically do not open until 30 to 45 minutes after opening. Heck, those entire areas may not be open yet. This is a pretty common practice across the SeaWorld parks. I recommend arriving at the park at least a half hour before the posted opening time. Keep in mind Busch Gardens is a sizable parking lot, and it can be a bit of a walk to the front gate unless you have preferred parking. Once inside, you want to start with Pantheon as long as you're one of the first people in line. This is where most people went at Rope Drop in 2022. Once you get off that coaster, you should be able to snag a quick ride in Tempesto while it's still a walk-on. 
If it's roughly 30 to 45 minutes after opening, the rides on Oktoberfest should be now available. You then want to head back for Verbolten. If you enjoy this coaster, grab a few laps now because it's the shortest the line will be all day. This strategy knocks out three of the four worst lines. By the time you hit Invader, it may already have a bit of a line. If you're comfortable waiting until the evening, Invader's line almost always dies off entirely, and it's an awesome night ride anyway. As for how much time you'll need, I think it's entirely possible to do all the major rides at this park in a day, especially because the park has long hours and peak season. However, I like having two days at this park so I can soak up the park's atmosphere and have plenty of time for re-rides. I love this park's coaster lineup. Plus, a two-day ticket is usually just $5 to $15 more. If you choose to stay multiple days, there are plenty of hotels in the surrounding area, and if you're a history buff, you're in the historical triangle with Jamestown Colonial Williamsburg just a short drive away. One positive impact of the pandemic was that Busch Gardens Williamsburg switched to year-round operations. The park will run their coasters as long as the weather is above 40 to 42 degrees, so it's nice being able to ride some B&Ms in the winter months. Only a subset of the park's attractions are available in the winter months, and have changed what they offer year to year, so definitely check the website which rides will be open in advance of your visit. The downside with the year-round operations is that Busch Gardens Williamsburg now has less rides available in the spring months when the park used to be entirely available. Another thing to note is that some rides may only be available on weekends outside of summer. This could either be due to staffing or painting. Moving on to the ride lineup, Busch Gardens Williamsburg has a strong coaster lineup. While the park always had some highly regarded B&Ms, the park was lacking that unanimous world-class coaster. I think Pantheon fills that void nicely. This Intamin creation is fantastic. The two inversions are chock full of hang time. The Zero-G winder is delightfully slow. Then the stall is one of the best out there with the inverted airtime and head choppers. The ride also has some great airtime, particularly on the giant top hat and that outward banked hill. But the highlight for me is a swing launch sequence. While the launches aren't the most powerful out there, the stalls on the top hat and vertical spike induce some wonderful weightlessness. Then the bunny hills during the launch sequence offer powerful ejector pops, most notably when you're going backwards. I have a review going into more detail, but the elements, speed, and smoothness make this one of Virginia's best roller coasters. The best coaster of this park for airtime is Vapalo's Chariot. This was the prototype Balger Mabyard Hypercoaster. While the airtime isn't as intense as the newer installations, as I mentioned in a review, you gracefully levitate out of your seat for seconds at a time on the major drops if you're in the back. Along with the floater airtime and smoothness, I also love this ride's setting. While it runs along the parking lot, you feel completely secluded from the rest of the park as you travel out into the woods. Another great B&M is Griffin, which has a case as the best dive machine as I state in a review. This one runs with over-the-shoulder restraints, so you get tons of floater airtime on the two vertical drops, including the signature one at the start. But what makes this ride stand out from the other dive machines is the extra elements. You have two Immelmans, plus a few surprise bunny hills with pops of airtime. The final B&M may be the best in Alpengeist. This massive inverted coaster is nearly a hypercoaster, and the first half is a speed demon. The twisting first drop and initial four inversions have powerful positive Gs and abrupt snaps. The mid-course does sap the ride of a considerable amount of speed, but the final two inversions are still solid before the coaster finishes with a whimper on that final helix and turns. This is one of the better inverts out there, mostly because of that awesome first half. Loch Ness Monster is another looping coaster at the park. This classic arrow is less refined than Alpengeist, but it is a historic coaster. The drops give good airtime in the back, and the two vertical loops are forceful. The ride does have awkward pacing with the drawn out helix in the second lift hill in the middle though, and the valleys do shake, but it is still a unique and enjoyable experience. Tempesto is the park's premier ride Skyrocket 2. While the capacity is problematic for a park of this scale, I have no qualms with the ride itself. It may be a clone, but delivers a satisfying ride experience between the launch sequence, strong airtime going up and down the tower, and the hang time filled barrel roll high off the ground. Invader is a highly underrated GCI wood coaster, which I cover in a review. While it is one of their smallest coasters, the ride has an isolated setting and it's littered with quick pops of airtime. 
It's also fairly well paced and smooth. I prefer this coaster up front, but it's also worth trying in the back for the great airtime on that straight first drop. Verbolton replaced the beloved Big Bad Wolf and it's a worthy successor. The ride has the guise of a family coaster, but it has some sneaky strong moments. The launches have good punch to them. Then the indoor section is a strong pop of airtime and a grey out inducing helix, plus another surprise I don't want to spoil, but check out my review if you want to know exactly what happens. The final coaster is Grover's Alpine Express, which is a Zier Junior coaster. This is a really nice kitty coaster as it's smooth and has a little bit of force to it on the helixes. This is the main ride in the Sesame Street Kids area. This again is probably the most popular kitty area in the park because of the famous IP. I also really like Land of the Dragons with the massive play structure. Finally, there's a small cluster of kitty rides in the Italy section. I do like how these areas are scattered throughout the park, but they aren't as large as some kitty sections at other major parks. This also isn't the strongest park for flat rides. The Busch Gardens and SeaWorld parks never put much focus in this area for a long time. You have a few spinning rides, plus two notable modern flats. Mock Tower is often maligned, but I really like this Moser Drop Tower. The views are incredible between the ride's height and rotating seats. Then the drop has some airtime and stomach drop on the way down. The ride does have a ton of downtime, so if you see it open, do not hesitate jumping in line. The newest flat is Finnegan's Flyer, an SNS Scream and Swing. The cycle is short as always, but the ride offers some nice floater airtime, and it was placed on a hill so you feel even taller as you stare towards the ground. One area that has turned into a weakness is the dark ride department. Bush Gardens used to have a few dark rides, most notably Curse of Dark Castle, but they've all been closed and removed. It's disappointing because they offered a nice contrast from the coasters and provide an option during storms and cold weather. This park is still proficient in the water ride department though. Escape from Pompeii is the best of the bunch. This intimate shoot the shoots ride features the familiar climactic drop that gives a little bit of floater airtime, plus a giant splash. But it's most notable for the extended indoor section loaded with fire effects. This ride is a spectacle. Le Scoot is a solid log flume with an elevated layout and a sizable final plunge. Then Roman Rapids isn't one of my favorite Rapids rides. It is well landscaped, but there is a severe lack of Rapids. You will still get soaked though from the waterfall finale. While Bush Gardens doesn't have an attached water park, they do own the nearby water country. I've never visited this park, but I've heard good things about its slide lineup. Bush Gardens also has pretty good shows. I usually focus on the rides, but the ones I've seen over the years have good production value. Then if you're an animal fan, there are a few animals scattered throughout the park, including the chain's famous Clydesdale horses. Hallow Scream is the park's popular Halloween event. I've heard this can be a busy time to visit, and I've always heard good things about the haunts. I visited on a super rainy night in 2021, and everything was a walk-on. I thought the haunts were just okay though. I've heard from locals that the event was weaker in 2021, so hopefully that's not indicative of the future. For food, there are three options I highly recommend within the park. For meals, I love Trapper's Smokehouse. The brisket in particular is amazing, not only for a theme park, but in general. For snacks, I love the pretzel place in Oktoberfest. Make sure to get a fresh one because they're doughy and buttery. While I don't like sweets, my fiance loved the Dole Whip that you can get in a pineapple at Roman Freeze over by Apollo's Chariot. If you're looking for food outside the park, I strongly recommend Maurizio's. It's just 5 minutes away and this Italian restaurant has some of the best pasta I've ever tasted. Busch Gardens Williamsburg is one of the pricier parks out there costing $95 to $125 per day without any discounts. But if you buy in advance online, you can save $35 to $40. I typically visit a SeaWorld park using a Platinum Pass. This grants you access to all 11 parks on the chain. If you buy the one with Busch Gardens Williamsburg as your home park, you'll be paying nearly $400. However, you can buy a Platinum Pass for a different home park for nearly half the price. The ones for Sesame Place and SeaWorld San Antonio tend to be the cheapest. Just note there are some benefits specific to your home park such as the free tickets and some of the special experiences. One final note is that if you want to use a GoPro, 
Just note that you need to go to Guest Relations to get a camera card. This is an extra step you don't need to take at the other SeaWorld parks. I think this is the best park in the SeaWorld chain. The way Busch Gardens blends top-notch coasters with good theming and landscaping makes it easy to have a great day. This is one of the best parks in the country, and I relish each visit here. And compared to most other top-tier parks, lines are less likely to be a major issue which is refreshing. Needless to say, I highly recommend this park. I think Kings Dominion does have the state's two best coasters, and there are more options for kids, but I far prefer Busch Gardens Williamsburg overall. So those are my thoughts on Busch Gardens Williamsburg. What are your thoughts about this Virginian theme park? Do you agree it's the best park in the SeaWorld chain? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I'd appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you consider subscribing because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.